and I'm expecting Mikolokwani and all of this and hands and all of this. Did I jump before the drum beat? You may be seated. His Excellency Chancellor of the University of South Africa, President uh, Tabumbeki, Madam Acting Vice Chancellor, Professor Tenjue Meiwa, and members of MENCOM present here, Executive Dean of the TM School, Professor Vilnkom and his management team, and all the deans from various colleges, uh, colleagues from different colleges, support staff, special guests, students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Another warm round of applause for you for being here today. Thank you. Today is not about long speeches. We are here for interactions. And I would also request that those who are on the program stick to the time so that we can have a feast of ideas, exchange of ideas here with uh, the public as well as with our special panelists and our patron. And I have also noticed that most professionals struggle to stick to the time allocated. And I think HR must work hard. All HR in whatever entities, we should work hard to make sure that we, they train us on how to stick to time. If you are given five minutes, if you are given three minutes, Please stick to the time. As you can see, we are starting a bit late, but we will make up for the time that we have already uh, lost. And I, I'm sure of the program, people that I have on the program today that will be able, I'm quite sure, they come from the TM school, and I know that they will be able to, 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 to demonstrate this skill adequately. Um, Colleagues, welcome all to UNISA. Welcome all to the, um, the TM School. And we really uh, appreciate your presence here this afternoon because it's important uh, that uh, this conversation keeps on taking place at this August institution. 
And without much further ado, I would like to call our acting vice principal and, and uh, acting principal and vice chancellor, Professor T. Mayua, to the podium to welcome all of you officially. Thank you. Just when I'm trying to get to it, my um, system wants to die on me. It can't, it doesn't have a choice. Program Director Prof. Edith, I can see where she is. Paswana, Director of Tabombegi African School of Public and International Affairs. His Excellency Dr. Tabombegi, UNICE Chancellor, patron of the Tabombegi African School of Public and International Affairs, and former President of the Republic of South Africa, Professor Sibusiso Vilnkomo, Executive Dean of the Tabombegi African School of Public and International Affairs, and other members of the University Management present this evening, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassadors, High Commissioners are present. Mr. David Litswalo, Director of Tabombegi African School um, of Public and International Affairs, members of the public, uh, members of the business community, institutions of higher education, representative of the national, provincial, local government, various political parties present this evening, Student at the Tabomegi African School of Public and International Affairs, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests again, students, fellow scholars, Dumelang, Moluin, good afternoon, good evening actually, it's evening, yeah? Jumbo. Allow me to extend a warm welcome to all present this evening on behalf of uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Plain Linkebula the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of UNISA, who is traveling on UNISA business, and do so also on our entire management team and myself as the acting VC for the past two weeks. We gather once more um, for the esteemed occasion, this occasion of Tabombegi Schools Public Conversations with uh, Dr. Tabombegi himself, the TMF, Foundation, that's the Tabundegi Foundation, came from. Since the inception, And an exchange that's aligned with our institution's core mission as a center of our learning. As we convene this year, ladies and gentlemen, we do so amidst a South Africa that's celebrating 30 years of freedom and democracy and nearly seven decades since Africa's liberation from the colonial rule. Despite these significant challenges and milestones that we know of Africa in particular, our global landscape remains dynamic and fraught with challenges. Yet, just as generations before us, thanks a program director, have done, we can shape the future through innovation, activism, 
and imagination. And indeed, this conversation, I want to believe, is going to be looking at that. As we do that, these elements hold immense promise for our continent and generations to come. UNISA takes pride in its partnership with the Tabombegi Foundation, and this is manifested in the TM School that we have, which aims to train leaders who can tackle African complex issues. These, of course, are rooted in Afrocentric and Pan-African perspectives. This kind of collaboration is instrumental in shaping a better future for our continent. And I must say, distinguished guests, that uh, I cannot but want to pause a bit and reflect on the very first presidential and prime minister of Ghana, Nkwame Nkrumah, in his address. This was 1963 at the founding of the OAU in Addis Ababa. He says, we must unite now or perish. We recognize our, the need to organize and that our organizing should be our economic, for our economic independence that resides in our African Union. And that requires the same concentration upon the political achievements at close court. So looking at this quotation of 1963, it sounds like it's actually was this morning and was directed to this audience and more in particular to the TM School. Over the past 14 years of the TM School, uh, existence and involvement into a beacon of academic excellence, addressing the pressing needs of Africa and the world at large has been part of our business. In alignment with schools endeavors towards a liberated and prosperous Africa, the Africa we all want to see prosper. The TM School's journey has been marked by significant achievements, including the development of core areas of study such as citizenship studies, public leadership studies, and sustainable livelihoods. We commend the tireless efforts of the TM School team in driving these advancements. I'm certain we shall be hearing more about them in a short while. In a world distinguished guests, marked by constant change, forums like the TM School Conversation, this conversation this evening, offer us invaluable opportunities for the reflection and collective dialogue as a university, as the country, as the continent, and our contribution to the world. The current global challenges underscore the agency for innovative solutions and alternative futures. It is incumbent upon us to reimagine and rebuild our world for the betterment of humanity. Indeed, along the lines of what Kwame Nkrumah said in 1963. As we embark on this first of the two TM school conversations in 2024, I extend my best wishes to all participants. Your contributions are essential in shaping a brighter tomorrow. You are welcome to this conversation. Thank you. Gabon. Thank you, Acting Vice Chancellor for this warm welcome. I think everyone is feeling at home right now. And I think you have reflected on the value of this conversation that have actually even grown beyond the university to be a, a, a conversation that the public looks forward to. Uh, just to think about it, even today, we were supposed to be at Senate Hall, but the numbers made us to be here this afternoon. Without wasting any time, let me invite to the podium our Executive Dean, Professor Vilinkomu, who's going to give a few remarks. Well, let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Madam Chair. Mr. President, 
when we started planning for this occasion, we were talking about you need an introduction, and I said no. When I was taught about diplomacy, you don't introduce a president, because a president is always a president. So thank you very much for being here. I'm going to highlight a few points. You remain a leader, a pillar of strength, hope for this continent and South Africa. We need hope. Without hope, we can't go anywhere. Your candidness, clarity, and analysis on matters pertaining to South Africa and the continent and the world are a source of inspiration for many others to emulate. And in particular, young people who've got to take the baton and run with it. We thank you for having given your name to the Tabernbeke School. The TM School reflects the following Africanization, Pan Africanization, Globalization, African diaspora knowledge, non racialism, and your values. We want to keep those intact, very intact. We therefore challenge our students to be high achievers, to be economists like you. To be, a diplomat, to be diplomats like you have been, to be a president, we want them to be achievers, not mediocre students. Intellectually, we want them to be sound, very sound, articulate and be able to debate and confront issues of the day and issues of the future. We must also understand the relationship between education and society's development. The protection of human rights, we were in the forefront of making sure that apartheid was declared a crime against humanity. The protection of human rights is very significant for our students to understand. Peace and development, very critical. Be in search for new knowledge in a rapidly changing global order, an order which in 10 years' time, young people will have to confront and say, this is the world we live in. And finally, your clarion call for Africa to take up its rightful place in the world is uppermost for the Tarun Beki African School of Public and International Affairs. We're delighted to have you here and we're looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vilinkoma. A warm round of applause again. At this point in time, I'm going to request uh, Mr. David Lezualo, our Director for Student Affairs at the TM School, the unit that is responsible for putting up this event, uh, to come to the front and tell us about the school, because I think it's important that we get to know what the school does and what the school is all about. Uh, Mr. Lezualo is coming here. Please pay attention as you will get a glimpse of what the school has to offer. Perhaps in the second semester, we will see you here. You will consider joining us for your own upskilling and reskilling through the SRP programs that we offer here and the future MA and PhDs that the school is going to offer uh, once we complete our accreditation process. Uh, I think we are at the final stages. Over to you, Mr. Zola. Director, Professor Edith Paswano, and I also want to salute 
the Chancellor of the University of South Africa, His Excellency, former President Tabonbeke. I salute the acting Vice Chancellor and Principal of this very same university, Professor Tinjui Meiwa, and other members of the university management present here this afternoon. Esteemed members of the Council of UNISA, the Executive Dean of the TM School, Professor Vinny Bono, staff and students at the university, panelists for the discussion this afternoon, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and I dare say the media, members of the audience, including the millions who are with us virtually. Colleagues in the Tabubek African School, Public and International Affairs, colleagues from the Tabubek Foundation present here, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. At this stage, ladies and gentlemen, let me directly address the Executive Dean of the TM School, Professor Vinny Kong, for traversing the difficult and yet preferable journey of taking the school from ground zero to where it is today. In case you haven't said it before, we hereby say it here and now today. Thanks for the diplomatic leadership and the lesson that you continue to give us indirectly, that of being able to speak with concision and brevity. That's a very skill, uh, Prof. Vilong Kong. If it's permissible, Program Director, I would like to further register our sincerest appreciation to the Chancellor of the University, former President Tabon Baker, for consistently making himself available to us and the student community at the TM School and UNISA. And importantly, I reiterate the point made by Prof. Nkomo just a few seconds ago, that for appreciating President Mbeki for agreeing to have this premier graduate school named after him. We are thus immensely privileged to be part of and indeed to be associated with such a majestic project. Mr. Chancellor, I am an African. So, my Africa, allow me to start with a constructive digression or a useful piece of irrelevance. A year or so ago, I was privileged to eavesdrop a very interesting conversation between two highly esteemed professors. The discussion centered around who, or rather, what Tawambek is a situation that sounded like the definition of President Mbeki. And I, I stayed off that because Kamu Bedi Ware Mudula Tuko Yipoloki Vikisa Nipo Chela Ki Madia Fofa So the debate or the discussion was whether former President Mbeki is a politician a cadre, a revolutionarist, a leader, an intellectual, a thought leader, a sage, a pan-Africanist, a statesman, an interna internationalist, a diplomat, an economist, a philosopher, a visionary, a literary man, a poet, an elder, and a pillar of strength, and so on. And so on. 
at the end, I cannot recall what the conclusion of that discussion was, but there was the conclusion. And in this context, Prabhupada Komo has warned us against Guru Fahim, former President Mbeki. What is so clear though is that some of these values or attributes or descriptors have inspired the establishment or the founding of this premier graduate school that aims to ensure that Africa does influence the world. By the way, the notion of global impact is taken seriously at this university. During the official opening of the 2024 academic year at UNISA, President Big posed a very provocative question to the UNISA community, and that question was, can blacks think? And what that question did or does is to plunge us in the depth of meta-thinking or meta-cognition where we engage in the act of thinking about thinking. Basically, it propels and stimulates us to entertain or to enter the realm of intellectual enterprise. Do we have centers of thinking, especially about the black condition or African condition? I believe that UNISA, which is a university that has boldly positioned itself as the African university, should fairly be considered appropriately convenient spaces for such an undertaking. It is in this context that the Tawambek African School of Public and International Affairs is said to be oppositely cushioned in this great university, the University of South Africa. Program Director, I'm trying to rush to the end. So, the perennial question that Professor Komar relentlessly poses is, why do universities exist? He started debating this question as early as 2009. Why do they exist in South Africa, in Africa, and the world? And he continues to ask the question, do these universities serve any purpose, or have we just inherited them from the colonial system? His argument is that if you want to be globally competitive, you have to add value. In other words, what is the value add of our universities in the global spectrum of world affairs? President Becky, on the occasion of the launch of the school on the 22nd of September in 2020, addressed this question in a paraphrase. The school should produce students who are critical thinkers who will not join the army of the unemployed. The corollary created by this question of why do universities exist is why do students attend university? The young 26-year-old Kwame Nguma already answered that question precisely on the 1st of March 1935, almost 85 years ago. And, uh, and in his articulation, he said, and I want to quote, in all things I have done, I've held myself to do but one ambition, and that is to make the necessary arrangements for me to continue my education in the United States of America, that I may be better prepared and still be of better use to my fellow men, not to myself, but to my fellow men. This should bring me to the discussion of what the TM school is. And Prime Director, I think you are delighted that I'm traversing this point. The Tarambit African School of Public and International Affairs, that is the TM School, was established as a magnet of excellence, magnet of academic excellence of the University of South Africa, which is mandated to offer education that would bring meaningful change to society, especially the African continent, on matters of leadership, governance, and development. This entails producing graduates who can respond to the ever-evolving challenges of the modern world in the 21st century. This mandate is aptly captured in the vision of creating an African, global, and futuristic school of public and international affairs as propelled by the quest to become a beacon and magnet of excellence in balancing theory and practice 
in milk production, ut utilizing transdisciplinary approaches. Additionally, the school is driven by the goal and the mantra of developing and educating leaders who solve complex problems in Africa and beyond. I would like the, the support, the typical support people to assist me in show, showcasing the, the, the problems that the school is really about. And I would like to start with the, the, the notion of what the vision and mission of this school is really about. And uh, without any wasting time, Program Director, I really please to appreciate that this is the very, very core of why I'm here this afternoon. So the vision and mission of the school is to create an African emphasize African global and futuristic school of public and international affairs and therefore becoming a beacon of excellence as I've said about the theory and practice being integrated in a transdisciplinary mode and therefore developing the kind of students that I have already referred to. Coming to the issue of curricular and research for CHI, we need to address the development challenges of societies challenges of societies and in fact to change societies if needs be to search for new knowledge and ideas to provide useful knowledge and to be in the forefront of the logic of invention and the logic of discovery and to contribute to global discoveries in other ways for the school to influence the world not to always be the recipient and critical recipient of what the world offers. The important aspect that constitutes the school is its focus areas, because the school has to fill a gap or a, a lacuna that has been created by previous systems, usually those that haven't been tempered from a pan-European or Euro-American education perspective. So we in the school are proud to present to our students the following uh, focus areas. I'll start with the study of government affairs. Then we have urban and regional affairs, simulation and future studies, security and intelligence studies, sustainable livelihoods and resource management, international and diplomacy studies, peace and development studies, public leadership studies, and of course, citizenship and development. If you apply your mind critically to these focus areas, you realize that these are the answers to the current challenges that are facing humanity, the continent, and South Africa today. The program director has already indicated that we have master's and uh, doctoral programs that the school has been mandated to, to offer. Given the focus areas that I've already elucidated, these programs will be in the area of public and international affairs. So we'll have our master's uh, in, in public and international affairs by research, master's in public and international affairs by coursework, and the PhD in public and international affairs by research. Programs, um, which we are currently offering, we have got about eight short learning programs which are at advanced level, and these include a course in thought leadership for Africa's renewal. Prof Professor Maywa, it would be interesting if this this SLP could be made a compulsory uh, module for staff at UNISA because it's about decolonization and pan-Africanism.
So we cannot talk about decolonization whereas we don't do these particular short learning programs. So let, us, let it be a prerequisite that before you open your mouth and talk about decolonization, you must show us. Then we have advanced program in policy making and analysis for Africa's development, underline Africa's development. Then we have advanced course in good governance in Africa. Good governance in Africa. Good governance. An advanced course in humanitarian and development leadership. Advanced course in diplomacy studies. Let me highlight that recently South Africa has demonstrated the very essence of diplomacy studies. And we in the, uh, in the Tawambeki African School of Public and International Affairs play in that area as well. Then follows the advanced program in dynamics of peace and conflict in Africa, advanced course in intelligence management, and finally advanced security management on the African continent within a global context. I'm not going to talk to that slide. I want to finally talk to the slide on partnerships and internationalization. You cannot claim to be an African or continental school of global impact if you don't have a footprint in the world. Hence, our portfolio on internationalization is very, very critical in this regard. We are creating partnerships in Africa, various regions of Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas, as it were. And with this, we hope to create that kind of global network that will make this school truly, not only as a rhetoric, truly international, to have global impact in, in the correct sense. I don't want to talk too much about the, 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 the slide on research activities. But if the program director allows me, I'll just mention that um, the TM School's Academic Research and Knowledge Hub supports all focus areas housed in this school. It also holds the International Journal of African Renaissance Studies. So this journal is accredited by the Department of Higher Education. The school also hosts the South African Democracy Education Trust SADET project, which documents the history of the struggle in South Africa. The school seeks to appoint scholars and professors extraordinary who can be part of its academic and research activities. We do have postdoctoral fellows like in various parts of the university that are recruited as part of our research strategy. Finally, I want to indicate that uh, we do have other research fellowships academic associates, ambassadors or professionals in residence, and so on and so forth. Pro program director, on the issue of uh, catalytic niche areas in the school, I think it is proper that the audience takes notice of the fact that within the 10 catalytic niche areas of the university, the TM school has selected to participate and contribute knowledge in terms of policy and policy science and technology, women, Bosadi, theorizations, and enhancing South Africa's maritime interests. In short, ladies and gentlemen, we want to say from what we have indicated that we understand that education is for change. So many people, of course, do have that famous quote by former President Nelson Mandela that says that um, education is a powerful weapon that you can use to change the world. But I believe that uh, uh, Professor Henry Clark puts it very, very succinctly and boldly, radically, to say, and I quote, our crisis today is we do not seem to understand that a revolution means a complete change. In a revolution, you do not patch an old society. You replace an old society. When a society has grown old, weak, fat, and flabby, and fails to serve its people,
the conscious role of those who have suffered from that society is not to prop up that society, but to change that society in such a way that it will never, never be the same again. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Manza, awe tu, awe tu. Thank you very much, uh, comrades and friends. Manza, hey, there is no oomph in this room, man. What's wrong? Manza, awe tu. Forward with free education. Forward. Forward with free decolonized education. Forward. Thank you very much, comrades and friends. Uh, my name is Nkosinati Mabilani, the SRC president of UNISA. Greetings uh, to the Chancellor, His Excellency, President Tabumbeki, uh, to the acting VC, Prof. Meiwa, to the VC, Prof. Linkambula, who's in Korea, to the young people of this university and the young adults of UNISA, both registered and the alumni in South Africa and all over the globe. Comrades and friends, we are honored to be invited to contribute uh, to this platform that is characterized by informative domestic and global issues, particularly because we are feeding from wisdom of our revolutionary economist, political giant, peacemaker, unifier, and most importantly, a mentor for the present and future leaders. Comrades and friends, comrades and friends, myself and the former president are the only two people in this program that are allowed to be controversial. <laughs> Both myself and the former president are not employees of the university, and we are also the only presidents in this university. <laughs> but for that reason, we will speak fully and we will speak freely. And we hope to be understood by all who are here. Comrades and friends, Comrade Mbeki, I want to tell you about my experience this past week. Uh, Comrade Mbeki, 2024 uh, is the year that marks the 30th anniversary of our democracy. I want to share with you, President, about my trip earlier on on the week when I was going home in Mamilodi. I used a train from Pretoria Station to Mamilodi. However, my trip was cut short because the train Ilea Staga, Barista Gili. While waiting for a good four hours for an engineer to arrive, next to me was seated a young lady by the name of Tinsualo. Who, who greeted me after seeing that I was wearing 
Yunisa Rikalia, SRC Rikalia. Tinsualo tells me that she was born in Mamilodi and was privileged to get grant money. Tinsualo also was, 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 was privileged to attend a government school and took advantage of the feeding scheme. Although at some point it, it got compromised because of the corruption that we are facing in our society. Comrade President, Tinsualo painted a very good picture of the first decade and a half of our democracy. But equally, an extremely dark and gloomy future if things were to stay the same. Tinsualo tells me that she has graduated with a medicine degree and has been without a job since 2022. Tinsualo, despite being educated, cannot find a job in her field of study. Although our hospitals are overburdened and understaffed, Tinsualo still can't get placement. The government argues that there is no budget to hire new doctors. These are students who spend over seven years at the university level. This is evident, Comrade President, in the recent budget cuts that we are facing uh, uh, in the country. Comrade President, I must share with you that 70% of Comrade Tinsualo's classmates will drop out of the university system simply because there is no enough support and as far as it's dysfunctional and systems are not working. Their accommodation bill is skyrocketing and they've got no tools of trade, meaning they can't access uh, online uh, 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 books and so forth. Quite shockingly, Tinsualo further moved my conscience and my consciousness by requesting by requesting to be furnished with the application dates of UNISA so that she can apply for a postgraduate certificate in education, a PGC, so that she can get a job in one of the township schools and be able to teach at least maths or physics. Comrade President, Tinsualo will not be getting this, uh, this funding for this program because long after you left government, the government decided to not fund postgraduate studies anymore. By implications, Comrade President, Tinsualo and many other young people that wishes to enroll for postgraduate studies will not pursue their academic studies because there is no NSFAS funding for that. In, in addition, Tinsualo will add to a long list of women who are graduates in majority who, are, who, who can't further their studies who are unemployed, and, 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 and by then, further they experience GBV cases and faces poverty, and therefore are still chained to the yoke of triple oppression, that is the oppression of class, gender, and race. Comrade President, I also want to take this opportunity to indicate the fact that this year is the year of elections, not only in our country, but even the Sadak region, and even broader into the continents with countries like Botswana, Mauritius, Namibia, Mozambique, Senegal, Tunisia, just to name a few, and not forgetting the USA. As a continental SRC president, and the, pres uh, the SRC president of the biggest university, I want to encourage all of my students who reside in all of these countries that I've mentioned to participate in the democratic processes and vote for their political parties that represent the creation of employment that recognizes the rights of LGBTQI plus community, and importantly, they must do away with puppets of Western rule. <laughs> Pre President Mbegi, I want, I want this university to take a bold move and follow the direction of national government and parliament and sanction all businesses and companies with links to Israel. In fact, we want to encourage our students, Comrade President, to stop buying McDonald's because we cannot sympathize with entities that have historical and present relationships with the murderous apartheid state of Israel. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Lastly, Comrade President, uh, on the opening of the university, uh, the chairperson of APSA Union uh, uh, stood here boldly 
who is clearly on a recruiting drive, rhetorically took the platform and mentioned that workers of this university must work from home. Now, what boggles our mind as student leaders is that what does this chairperson actually mean when he says academics must work from home? We don't understand that. The chairperson, who is also a former student, has is, is escaped with his consciousness escaped him. He tells the universities that they must remain home. I want to take this opportunity and reject reject that call because our students are saying to us that it is impossible to work from home. Some of our students are disadvantaged. They live in shacks. They don't have connectivity. Uh, they can't access uh, emails. They don't have Wi-Fi. But also they can't reach lecturers on the emails and calls because some of our lecturers don't answer their emails and don't respond to calls. We live in a country where we are most of the time load shedded. This means that it will make it extremely difficult for a student to be online and be doing assignments. But we also ask them, if workers and lecturers and academics are at home, what must happen to this beautiful multi-billion infrastructure of UNISA if the people are working from home? <laughs> students, students of UNISA, worry not. I want to declare it here that the UNISA National SRC will not support such a program of having workers to work remotely. We want to see academics in their offices, in their lecture halls, pushing the, 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 the teaching and learning and knowledge production. The chairperson of APSA must focus on his fixed terms. There, maybe we might support him. I want to also highlight here, the CEO of Yahoo recalled these workers to come back to the office. Starbucks CEO recalled these staff at General Motors, Disney, Dell, and Meta have all recalled workers. So what science is ABSA Union working on? So we want to say that to our students, they must be rest assured, uh, academics and lecturers will be found at the university every day of the week. Program director, on the 29th of May is the general elections of South Africa. The responsibility is with the youth of this country. We will decide who will form part of the government. We will decide who will give us free education in our lifetime. We will decide on the party that prioritizes the youth. We will decide on the party that will distribute sanitary towels for free. We will decide on the party that speaks on the land question. We will decide on, on the future of this country. We know the true friend of the revolution and the enemy of the revolution. We encourage the students of this university to go out in their numbers on the 29th of May to make the choice to vote for the correct political party, but also to ensure that the, the country is in safe hands. I want to thank you all for this opportunity. Amanda! Amanda! Tawombeke remorada kaufela We molo we molo We molo we molo Tawombeke remorada kaufela Reza maya liena We molo molo Amanda Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mabelani. That's the NSRC president. I, who was addressing the president, and I thought he will speak to our students. Welcome to our new cohort of students 2024. We welcome you, we acknowledge you, and we also appreciate that you chose UNISA and the TM School as your point of study. And we are looking forward to your hard work, as well as you making sure that you make the good experience of being here at UNISA. UNISA is an open distance learning and sometimes can be lonely. But we are here to support you and feel at home and make sure that you look at your studying material and you see what should be happening 
on those things. And your lecturers are here, you will meet them when we are taking a group photo at the end of the day. Thank you. We are now transitioning into the heart of this program. With me, I have four panelists, which I will invite to the front. I will call each one and read their bio so that, and if I read your bio, please come to the front. There are beautiful couches here in the front for you. You can choose to sit uh, at, at each one of, any one of them. Our first panelist is Dineo Moya, who is a consumer scientist specializing in the field of fashion. She completed her bachelor's honors and is currently completing a master's in consumer sciences at UNISA. She's an alumni of the TM School and completed the Thought Leadership for Africa's Renewal Program in 2021. She's also a national committee member of the South African Bureau of Standards. Uh, for clothing and sizing systems and currently works in corporate retail in Cape Town. She is passionate about the transformation of Africa's economy through trade. Let's welcome Dineo. Our second uh, panelist is Dr. Palisas Khejan. Dr. Skrejani is currently the executive head in the Human Science Research Council's institute called AISA, an Africa-focused research division and a director for strategic partnerships at AISA. She was recently appointed as an International Science Council a fellow and the Science for Africa Foundation, Africa Program, or Possible as they call it, the chairperson of the, she's the chairperson of the committee. Uh, she's also a science policy technical advisor to the Malawi Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. A warm round of applause for Dr. Skejan. <laughs> Our third panelist is uh, Mr. Jonathan Rankin. Jonathan is eternally curious by nature and subsequently an astute academic. He currently works uh, work as a wealth manager in the financial services industry. A warm welcome, that's a very brief one. <laughs> I know a lot. And what I know well, uh, Jonathan is one of our alumni as well through the PPS uh, Foundation. Uh, so I know that uh, you are also an alumni. All of them are our former students. Our fourth uh, panelist is Tembisi Lemahua. Tembisi Lemahua is an award-winning lawyer from South Africa with a decade-long experience in leadership. She has been recognized as one of the top 30 most memorable women of 2023 in South Africa, as well as 100 most notable women in Africa 2024. She has been recognized by platforms such as the International Women in Law Justicia Award, 100 more women in the legal field, Houghton Legislature to name a few. She is pursuing her Master's of Law degree specializing in international human rights and has completed the policy making for Africa's development program with the Tawambeki School. A warm round of applause for our sister, Palisa. Thank you. I now have the pleasure, the honor, the privilege to, in, to introduce and welcome the patron of the TM School to the stage, Chancellor of the University of South Africa, former President of the Republic of South Africa, His Excellency, Dr. Thabo Mvuelo Mbeki. A warm round of applause, please. Thank you. You may be seated. I also don't want to make mistakes. I see there's a, a, 
a mic from SABC, and the gentleman came here earlier. I don't know where is it going now, because I don't want to, to make any mistake, because I'm aware that the former group CEO of the SABC, Mr. Madoda Mkakwe, is here. I don't want to make mistakes. Whether I should put it there or they will come and, and, and take it uh, to the... Okay, thank you. Thank you. A warm round of applause for our panelists, please. Right, today we have four panelists in front of us who are going to raise questions on African affairs, including reflection of on South Africa's 30 years of democracy. And the panelists will um, reflect on themes of their choices, themes that they are interested in, what we need to be mindful of uh, as well in those themes or those areas of focus that they are working on or the, of their interest as well, what needs to change, and then raise questions that give them sleepless nights about the continent, about the country, and uh, these questions are directed to former uh, uh, president and basically to solicit his views and his perspective on them. Uh, so there are no right or, or wrong answers, Mr. President. It's just to solicit your views on these uh, issues that they will raise here. And I think that we, we do this because uh, we regard President Mbeki as a living institution in his own right. I thought you were going to clap hands for that. As someone who served at the apex of leadership at the continent and uh, specifically also in this country, we, we regard him as this living institution because of his vast experiences of saving this country and the continent from a very young age. And we believe that through these conversations, current and future generations will have the opportunity to drink from this well of wisdom. And I guess we have an archive of the videos of this conversation. And I invite you to look at them and reflect on, on, on the questions that are raised and his responses to some of these questions. And I think those who are researchers as well there are insights that can be gleaned from those videos. And I know that in most uh, of our media platforms, we find that people just go to a soundbite and put it on TikTok without actually you getting the gist of what exactly the president said. And they just go for two liners or three liners. And that's why I'm inviting you to always, even after these events, to go back to the video so that you can have a context of where he was speaking and what was it about and why he was saying the things that he's saying. I'm going to now allow, uh, uh, I will start with you, um, Tembi, Tembi Sile, uh, to reflect. Each one of them is going to have five minutes uh, to, to, to really uh, talk their points issues that give them sleepless nights about this continent, about this country, and then ask a question. And later, when they are, each one of them has done, the president will respond to these young people. And then you will also have an opportunity to ask questions. Over to you, Tembisile. Thank you very much, Program Director. Um, 
we have been given a, we have been allocated a specific time. Um, I'm a lawyer, so I'm here to redeem the image of the noble profession when it comes to time um, and timekeeping. So thank you very much. Um, I would love to at first um, greet the President, Your Excellency, uh, President Tabumbeki, um, the Acting Vice-Chancellor of UNISA, Prof. Meiwa, the Vice-Chancellor of the TM School, Professor Velingomo, um, all royalties present. I am not sure if uh, King Mashia is with us here. I would like to acknowledge you, sir, Nabantwana from all different kingdoms. I'm aware that you, um, even kingdom from Zimbabwe um, are here, President. So we'd like to acknowledge and thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now properly greet uh, Osingaye, uh, President Uzizi, Ujamagas Jatu, Madeche, Banise, Mubainoboya, Fakate, Sawanda Mungambil. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. I have a few questions. Um, I'm not sure if I've eaten into my uh, five minutes, the program director. Thank you very much. Um, President, let us probably start with democracy. Um, we are celebrating our 30th year of democracy in South Africa, and something that we really need to celebrate um, and, and highly note. Uh, we have witnessed the emergence of political parties which are breakaways from the African National Congress and are trying very hard to be impactful. Perhaps other arguments can be made that they are ineffective in being um, impactful. It seems like this is a prolificating idea for a government of national unity. My question, President, is what do you think is driving this? And would you relate it to the majority of our democracy? Um, we have also heard the African National Congress being referenced highly as a broad church. Seeing as these are breakaway organizations from the ANC, is this what the broad church of the ANC is, and is this what it means um, when the ANC is referred to as the, um, the broad church? I would like to take you, uh, your, your, your Excellency, to the elections we're having um, our elections on the 29th of May, the president has already, president of the NSRC has already said, um, and this is a day that was announced by, you know, the pres president Ramaphosa, um, and South Africans will be practicing their democratic right to vote, which is, of course, something that you've always advocated for, uh, president, you've always advocated for free and fair elections. Um, you have also served as the head of the uh, Commonwealth Electoral Commission, uh, sorry, mission in Ghana. Um, I'd like to ask you, what is your opinion on the letter that was sent by the opposition to the U.S. Ambassador, um, His Excellency Dr. Rubin, in requesting them to monitor our upcoming um, elections closely, in which uh, the said letter purported uh, substantive risks to, um, or that the MK party uh, may have towards our peaceful nature of our political discourse as a nation and the, and the election processes. And taking into cognizance, President, the ongoing cases, um, or the, rather the ongoing case in the electoral court um, where this week where it might come back that uh, the fact that members of the MK party have already threatened um, violence and civil un uh, unrest should they be kicked off the ballot. I mean, this really threatens, you know, um, the, 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 the election. So therefore, I would like to know what's your opinion on that, President. Um, I have another question, but it's a bit long, so I'll go to my next one. And it is influenced by the elections as well. We have seen, President, the, um, the coalition governments, you know, um, in a lot of municipalities already. Um, what strategies can be implemented to address the inherent tensions and conflict within um, coalition politics in South Africa, particularly concerning the balance of power, ideological differences, and the challenge of maintaining stability and effective government governance amidst diverse political interests. I'll stop there, President. Thank you. Program Director. 
Uh, our next speaker, thank you, Tembisile. I can see that you are focusing on domestic issues. Thank you very much. We will speak to Dineo. Dineo, over to you. Allow me to extend my greetings to our patron, Chancellor, and former President, Dr. Tabumbeki, the VC, the Deputy VC, leadership of the university, colleagues, the audience here, and even the ones joining us virtually, ladies and gentlemen, Gilishon Peel. My name is Dino Moya, and I am a proud African. So I'm in the field of consumer science, specializing in fashion, particularly the manufacturing and the retail sector. And in my line of work, I observe the advancement of manufacturing capabilities in other nations and continents you know, around the world, except that of my own. And I'm privileged today to share with you my frustrations, contentions in the form of questions in the area of leadership and industrialization. Now, we're all aware that the world is undergoing a transition into the virtual economy, fueled by systems of knowledge, science, technology, and innovation. These are increasingly changing life as we know it, the jobs that are available in the marketplace, industries that are becoming redundant, jobs that are becoming redundant, and ones that are becoming even more prominent. Meanwhile, our continent is struggling with foundational issues such as keeping the lights on. Now, central to industrialization is energy, and the conversation on ESCOM cannot be ignored. Exactly a hundred years ago, the Government Gazette on 6 March 1923 announced the establishment of the Electricity Supply Commission that we now know as ESCOM. And this was driven by industrialists. I'd like to quote Dr. Hendrik Johannes van der Beel, who's the first chairman of ESCOM. He said these words, Here lies before the Electricity Supply Commission a great task and a great responsibility. It will be our endeavor to play a part, not as those who follow where others lead, but as pioneers to foresee the needs of a country fast developing by wise anticipation, be ever ready to provide power without profit, wherever it may be required. Close quote. So in this sense, ESCOM became a leader in supplying energy to the nation. Fast forward to 1994, South Africa gained independence and we ushered in democracy. And dare I say, darkness as well. What contribution has the, the democratic government added to the innovation of the former government? In 30 years, which is exactly three decades, what has become of ESCOM under this leadership? Are we industrializing or are we becoming de-industrialized? And how can we even have the conversation on innovation, AI, and the metaverse when we can't even keep the lights on? So in my view, we're no longer leading, but we're following and we're lagging behind. Africa's share of global manufacturing has declined to about 3% in the 1970s to less than 2% currently. So it is important for us to decode sustainable industrialization in the African context. But in my view, central to this is leadership because we've got policies such as Agenda 2063 and being part of BRICS, which requires our leaders. I have said that the biggest crisis in the continent is the crisis of leadership. Once we can resolve that, it makes it easier for all the other sectors. Thank you. Under visionary leadership, nations such as China have been able to transform and economize and industrialize by cap capitalizing on their capabilities. China was poorer per capita than almost all African countries in the mid to late 1970s, but has now superseded us and is richer per capita than almost all African countries. Today, China dominates the manufacturing sector. In this auditorium alone, 
if you look at the garments that you're wearing, I'm pretty sure that a garment or part of it has been manufactured in China. In the words of PLO Lumumba, Africa consumes Africa consumes what it does not produce and produces what it does not consume. And this is our Achilles heel. So, former president, in your address at the Vietnam Institute of International Relations on the occasion of Africa Day celebrations in 2007, while you were president, you spoke about the faster technological advances impacting socioeconomic conditions and how they dictate the means and structure of production and how this will impact us, people of the South. As president, you emphasize the importance of harnessing our comparative advantage to advance in trade. Since then, what is the reflection on how we have harnessed our comparative advantages to industries in the continent, and how are we contributing to innovation instead of consuming? And on this backdrop, how does Africa tap into innovation AI, science, and technology when we are facing a leadership cri uh, crisis that is hampering sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dineo. Focusing on industrialization uh, and economy, and specifically here at home, you also touched on a sore point of ESCOM and energy. Uh, over to you, Dr. Palisa. Um, good afternoon, uh, His Excellency, um, the audience. Uh, let me also recognize the ambassadors in the room this afternoon. Uh, Mr. President, I think uh, when we are talking about South Africa uh, uh, realizing its democracy at 30, um, it, of course we have mixed emotions. Um, we are filled with hope, but also uh, as we celebrate it, we are reminded that... Um, Celebrating democracy at 30 in South Africa it cannot be viewed outside um, developmental challenges of any uh, developing country, particularly in the continent. So it's, it's not in isolation. So for me, that is to say uh, participation of youth and also fostering a citizen-centric um, democracy has to be observed and protected by all means so as to avoid what we are seeing unfolding in the Sahel, in the Western Africa. The Western African countries, countries amongst others, they are experiencing um, unconstitutional changes of government. Uh, we can also think about Senegal, which almost went the same route, whereas uh, Senegal is one of the countries that we thought of as a stable country in the Western Africa, and we, particularly with its successful coalition history. Um, so, Mr. President, increasingly, we see that African states are becoming authoritarian states. The Lome Declaration, which is asserted um, by the 1990s Declaration on the political and socio-economic situation and fundamental changes taking place in Africa, recognizes the need to depend a meaningful response and aid towards political environment that guarantees human rights and respect for constitutionalism. So I just want to take an excerpt from that uh, uh, declaration, which is about a political environment, and I quote, a political environment which guarantees human rights and observance of the rule of law would assure high standards of probity and accountability particularly on the part of those who hold public office. In continuation, the, uh, the, the member states represented by the presidents, heads of states, acknowledges that we accordingly commit ourselves to the further democratization of our society and to the consolidation of democratic institutions in our countries. Now, understanding that the Lome Declaration is an umbrella and overarching protocol or pro policy that uh, directs us to respond to the unconstitutional changes of government. And it is also believed that uh, it, it has held its uh, 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 normative framework to deal effectively and efficiently with this um, unconstitutional changes of government in Africa, especially with particular focus to, to the coups. And when we see this resurgence uh, occurring uh, in the West Africa and other uh, democracies that have matured, 
I'm quite curious that with South Africa reaching that maturity of its democracy, and we've seen the coups in Zimbabwe and the last talked about Lesotho's one. My concern really is that um, what do you believe are the root causes of these um, uh, uh, resurging military takeovers? And again, I'm asking this question uh, with the context of the reality of the situation in the DRC, the tension in the DRC and the Rwanda. The, the DRC, we know that it stretches over the three uh, regional economic countries, I mean, uh, economic communities. So I, I am I'm quite keen to understand that uh, although the African Peer Review Mechanism report in 2023 uh, noticed that there is a gap in this Lome Declaration, um, does it mean that we are seeing the decrease in the peer review mechanism? And so if in the case of South Africa that is seeing the maturing democracy, what are the implications of, this deter of the deterioration of, uh, deterioration of democracy, particularly when we have to think about the multilateral institutions, the regional economic uh, institutions, as well as the national um, institutions? Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Palisa Sakhajani, uh, uh, for raising those questions that are really focusing on the continent, I think. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, I think you are going to take us global now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, it's, very, it's tough to beat uh, these three ladies that are sitting next to me, but good evening, everyone, and um, what a privilege it is to be here with His Excellency. Can we please give him a round of applause, honestly? Um, and it's also a privilege to be on the best continent in the world and in the best country in the world as well. People forget that. So before you pack your bags and climb on a plane, remember that the grass is green where you water it. And so that's where, what we're trying to do here. But um, so, so the format of, of how I'm going to, to speak is going to be first the introduction of the topic, then I will look at uh, His Excellency's contribution to the issue at hand, then my little two cents perspective and opinion, and then I'm going to pose my question to Your Excellency. So the, the topic is international, oh, excuse me, illicit financial flows out of Africa. So what are illicit financial flows out of Africa? They are financial flows that are illegal in nature. This can be in the form of cash or lightweight, high-value commodities such as gold, platinum, and diamonds, etc. These illegal activities pillage Africa of its natural resources and make third parties wealthy whilst robbing us of potential economic activity. Illicit financial flows have a direct impact on government revenue and subsequently government expenditure. This then creates a vicious chain of events and anybody who studies economics knows that chain of events are very important. Uh, the vicious chain of events is that it leads to reduced government expenditure in crucial sectors of our economy and this leads to further unemployment, further illiteracy and further poverty. It affects every aspect of an economy and therefore all of us sitting right here. So I'm going to move on. I hope that was a, a, a brief explanation of illicit financial flows. And I'm going to move on to His Excellency's contribution to this issue. Um, Your, Your Excellency, at the Pan-African Parliament, you shared your findings of the African report. And you made... Excuse me. Is it, is it okay? Okay. You made um, combating illicit financial flows your top priority, or one of the, the top priorities at the time. Um, so thank you for that. You've always been uh, an example to everyone of what good governance is. And that is the root cause of almost everything, uh, is, is, is a lack of good governance. So this brings me to my perspective. Um, my perspective is that the root cause of this, all of this illicit financial flows out of Africa is poor governance. 
um, government leaders in Africa must remind themselves, and this is with all due respect, that they are public servants and not public thieves. Mark drop. <laughs> okay, this leads me to my two-parted question to Your Excellency, which is, Your Excellency, how can we address illicit financial flows out of Africa? And the second part is, what has changed since your findings in the African report until now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you for, to our panelists as well. I'm now going to hand over to the patron. I am in a very difficult position myself. Uh, uh, you know, I don't like impromptu questions. If it was me, I would be in trouble to answer all these questions. But I know that you are able, sir, your excellency will be able to tackle some of these questions that the young people have been asking. Over to you, sir. of our discussion this afternoon would we'll come back specifically to the matters he raises concerning students and fees and, and things like that. Uh, now Tim raised uh, started off by mentioning uh, uh, 30 years of democracy and then answers all sorts of questions that are related to this. Uh, that the now raised are also relevant to the same question about industrialization, ESCOM and uh, manufacturing and all of that. Uh, let, let me start by saying I think one of the things that worries me a great deal is that I think as a country don't understand South Africa in the same way. I think we carry in our heads different South Africans. Uh, and hence come with different solutions of what, whatever the challenges are. Uh, 
take this notion of 30 years of democracy. What has happened during these 30 years? I think one of the fascinating things about these 30 years is what has happened differences in the different periods within these 30 years. There is a, a gentleman in South Africa, I'm quite sure that he's not fed up with me because I keep quoting him. This is the, uh, the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, uh, Dr. John Andres. Last year, Dr. Andres uh, gave a speech somewhere in the U.S., uh, about the future of South Africa. I think all of us should read that, which is very interesting, and very educative, about 30 years of democracy in South Africa. And Dr. Endless says this, that you can divide this history of 30 years into three ages. He calls it ages. As age one, age two, and age three. And says age one is from 1994 to 2007. And age two is from 2008 to 2022. And now we are drifting towards the conclusion of age three. So Dr. Andres says, if you look at age one, the country is going up all the time. He says if we will take the number of people employed, in 1994, you got 8 million people employed. By 2008, it's 14 million. To contest this assertion that is made, that this was a period of jobless growth. Because in fact, there's enormous job creation during this period. Levels of unemployment dropped during this period. Um, the all manner of positive things. He gives all the detailed socioeconomic figures to show this upward process. That's what he calls age number one. Then as I was saying, he says age number two is from 2008 to 2022. And the direct opposite happens. So in these 30 years of democracy, we start off going this way, and from 2008 we start going the opposite direction. So next time you hear somebody saying, uh, uh, you've had this terrible 30 years of democracy, they are not, not telling the truth. They are not, uh, they are not, uh, they are not talking about South Africa, they are talking about another country. Um, and you can see why, one of the reasons, why from 2008, some of the socio-economic figures point downwards. Because <coughs> I'm sure all of us will remember that 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009 was this period of the global financial crisis. Started with the crisis in the U.S. banks. Uh, affected the whole world. 
impact it on us here. During that period, the job losses started happening. This is an exogenous impact on South Africa of the global economy, which is shrinking, and therefore, in terms of our exports and all of that, they get impacted upon by that. So I'm saying you can therefore see one of the reasons why from 2008, in terms of those socioeconomic figures, you would see a downward trend. But I don't think that is the entire explanation for this change. Because one of the puzzling things about this paradigm as explained by Dr. Andres is during age one, uh, the national government here is the ANC. During age two, national government is the same party. So question arises, what happened that the same party is able to lead the country in this very positive way during age one and leads the country in the opposite direction in terms of age two? That's a puzzle, that's a conundrum. If it was a change of party, another party took over, then we can explain it. But it's the same party. What happened? So I'm saying when we talk about uh, Tim Sealy, about 30 years of democracy, I think this is part of what we've got to take on board. That what Andres is saying is correct. Is factually correct. One of the things that Andres does not discuss, because you are not discussing that particular issue, is that it's during this age one that we adopt our current constitution, 1996. And part of what happens during that first period is that we then put in place all the institutions that are required of this constitution. So whether we're talking constitutional court or, or public protector or the commission on gender, gender and so on, gender issue and so on, all of these institutions, including the laws and regulations, come during this period. So this is a period, age number one, according to Dr. Andres, not only of socio-economic progress, but also the very entrenchment, the definition of democracy in this country comes during this period. challenges even with regard to that come during age number two. I think this is a distinction that we need to make. Even in the context of voting on the 29th of May, I think we need to understand that context in order to be able to know who are we voting for. Who are these people? Yeah. I am sure that uh, uh, all of us in this hall being very educated people, I'm sure all of us have read the report of the Nugent Commission on SARS. Comrade President, I'm sure you've read it. <laughs> you remember, colleagues, that what happened was, again, we're back, back to this age one and age two. There was a certain period 
when the South African revenue was outperforming itself in terms of collections, we'd always see this thing that uh, there would be a forecast to say that SARS will collect a billion rand this year. At the end of the financial year, you know, it's a billion plus. For a number of years, it was like this. And then during age two, it went the opposite direction. So I started underperforming. So that raised the question, clearly there is something wrong. What, what is wrong? That's how the New Gent Commission uh, of Inquiry, Judicial Commission was appointed by President Ramaphosa. To answer this question, what has gone wrong? Uh, I don't know if there's anybody here who would like to help me to say what, what does the Commission say? I'm looking for a hand. Uh, the Union Commission says, obviously I'm summarizing, that some people took a decision to destroy the institution. Now all of us will recall that what has happened during the, for instance, the proceedings of the Zondo Commission. There's been a big focus on the matter of looting. For instance, the state corporations, whether it's uh, Denel or ESCOM or the Transnet and so on, a lot of looting. The Gupta brothers and all of that. In this case of SARS, there was no looting. The Zonda, the Union Commission says there were people who took a decision to destroy the institution. That's a very remarkable statement in my view. Because SARS is responsible for 95, 98% of state revenues. You destroy SARS, you destroy the democratic state. And yet there were people who took a decision to do exactly that. So the New Gen Commission report, which I'm sure all of us have read, yeah, <laughs> gives in, in great detail what is it that happened to destroy this institution. the alarm sounded by the underperformance in terms of revenues was because of the success of the program to destroy the institution. So in that sense, the people who had taken the de decision to destroy the institution, they also provided the key to alert all of us to say there's something that's going wrong, which was what led to the formation of the New Gen Commission. Now the, some of us, after reading the New Gen Commission report, one of the things that stood out was the absence of looting. Because here's the state agency, it collects all these billions of rand. And you would think that one of the thin targets that would be would be to to steal. No, the intention was not to steal, but to destroy the institution. I think that tells us something. How how do we explain that? that there would be people who would deliberately set out to seek an outcome of that kind. These are obviously people who are hostile to the very existence of that democratic state. 
They don't want it to succeed. So they intervene. If we take away these revenues, it won't be possible for the state to succeed. I'm saying it must be that there, there are people there, those people, who are people who were uh, who didn't like our democracy and wanted something else. I think what the importance of that Nugent Commission report is that it actually communicated a very important message which all of us in South Africa should understand. And exactly this central point that there were certain people in the country who deliberately set out to destroy this democratic state. Therefore, it's not everybody who celebrated 1994. There's certainly, to some of our, our fellow citizens, 1994 represented a defeat. And they did not accept that it's going to be a defeat. So it was a temporary defeat for them, but they knew that in time we will win. The message I'm saying, colleagues, it still stands out, it's very stark in the Nugent Commission report. But I know the majority of us in this room here are hearing what I'm saying as, as, new, as new news. Fortunately, it's not fake news. <laughs> and part of the reason you are hearing it as new news is because for some reason, which I can't understand, the content of that report has not been widely reported in our media. It hasn't. In the Zondo Commission, continued, looked again at the SARS issue. They looked at the outcome of the Museum Commission of Inquiry on SARS, and they said, we agree with what that commission says and its outcomes. But we are going to look at the same question again because it's imperative in terms of our own mandate. And they did. The Zondo Commission looked at the SARS matter, continued, in fact, continued from a new gender. It's in the Zondo Commission report. It's in the public domain. And yet again, we have this strange phenomenon. I'm 
president that what I'm now saying about what the Zondo Commission says about who was responsible for this attempt to destroy science includes the president of the republic. That is new news. It isn't. The, uh, and of course you know who the president was. It's also in black and white, Jacob Zuma was part of the leadership in the process of destroy science. <laughs> That's not my opinion. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. Yeah. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. Now that's a bit of a conundrum. that you would have the President of the Republic of South Africa participating in a process to destroy the institution that gives him the means to govern. That's a kind of contradiction. The contradiction that then raises a question. Who indeed is this President? Because there is no way you are going to be able to square the circle that the President of the Republic of South Africa acts to destroy the South African Revenue Service. I, that is on the commission, is entirely wrong. Or you are dealing with somebody who is entirely wrong. Yeah. I'm saying, colleagues, that I think this is part of the process of the understanding of what Andres describes as age one and age two. And what happens during these two ages, which are opposite to each other. I think many of us in the room, are, perhaps with the exception of the panelists, uh, are old enough to remember when we first had our first national power cut, when the country went blank because of ESCOM, what is called load shedding, the national. The first time it happened was in January 2008. You remember that it, you know, even the mines, the mines had to shut down for the whole week. Yeah. Again, apart from, from our panelists here, yeah, uh, the older people would remember that uh, at that time I was president. And the previous month of December 2007, either December or November 2007, I'd, I'd apologize publicly because at that, that what had been happening is that you had uh, regional instances of load shedding. Yeah. So in November, December 2007, I apologized for that. I'm so on behalf of the government, we apologize for this because it's a re the reason for it is because there are certain things the government should have done and did not do. We delayed. And hence this, apologies to the nation. I repeated that in the State of the Nation Address 2008. You can read it up. It's on the internet. So, National Power Card, January 2008. Many, many years later, I read in the newspapers that uh, there's a report that has leaked which discusses the power failure of January 2008. And in reality, I was very wrong to apologize. 
Because what, what ESCOM did, what as, the practice within ESCOM at the time was that it had its own internal monitoring process about internal performance of the power stations. And the regulation was that each power station must have a minimum of 22 days, 22 days supply of coal immediately with it, uh, and not to go below that. So the internal monitoring system kept an eye on that. And already during December 2007, that monitoring system was telling the power station managers, you are running out of coal, replenish. And they didn't. What caused the power failure of January 2008 was the power stations ran out of coal. Because the power station coal managers at each station didn't respond to this alert from within this organization saying replenish. They didn't run out of coal. So you can't produce electricity in a coal-fired power station without coal. I think I'm saying I saw this thing in a report in a newspaper. It was a leak. So naturally, as you'd imagine, I'm very interested in all of this. This was a leak from a, a report of a special investigation unit. There was an SIU that had been commissioned to study certain things at ESCOM. That SIU reported to the president in 2017 and said what I'm saying. That the reason for the power failure in January 2008 was easily avoidable. Because all we needed to do was to replenish the coal supplies at the power stations. That's all. The SIU report says, but they didn't do it for whatever reason. That, that SIU report was never released publicly to, the, to this day, still not been released. But I, as you would imagine, I, I have some friends in high places. <laughs> so I asked them, I said, look, I've read in the media that there's such an SIU report. And it's in the office of the president. Can I please get a copy? And they gave me a copy. And indeed the report says what I've just said. Now, colleague, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm talk, talking, tell, talking too long. But I'm trying to talk about 30 years of democracy. question was raised very legitimately about ESCOM. I'm saying the first national power failure at ESCOM had absolutely nothing to do with the narrative that is told. No, this was failure of government. This, no, it had nothing to do with failure of government. It was a deliberate decision from within the organization to produce that crisis. And one of the immediate consequences of that is, according to the procedures at ESCOM, they declared an emergency. An emergency meant that uh, in terms of coal, for instance, you didn't have to put out tenders and all of that. You just go and buy coal where it is available. That immediately doubled the price of coal. Immediately. And that report will also say some of those station managers pocketed something from that. I 
I'm giving you colleagues an instance of part of what has been happening. I'm saying the, what the Nugent Commission particularly alerted us to, that there were some people in this country who did not like this democracy and sought to act in a negative manner to weaken it. I'm talking about ESCO. We take a decision, the government takes a decision, decision in 2004. Whereas we had been saying to ESCOM, look, don't build new capacity, generating capacity, for a number of reasons. We changed that and said 2004, okay, please build. That's when the decision was made to build Kusile, Medupi, Ingola, these power stations, 2004. But the record will tell you that the construction of Midupi, the first one, the first one to go under construction, started in 2007. So the question that arises in my head, What's the delay? Decision takes get taken in 2004. Implementation starts three years later. Why? It's not easy to find an answer to that question in terms of the ESCOM reports that we'll see on the internet. But the reason is in fact, let me say the reason. What happened was that they started to construct Midupi before 2007. Not surprising when the government says 2004, please build. But they had to stop the building, destroy what they had constructed. Because the companies that were paid and commissioned to prepare the building site for the building of Midupi didn't do their work properly. It's called geotechnical work. They didn't do their work properly. The result of which is when the construction of Midupi started, it sank. Had to be destroyed, more work done on the site. That delayed the construction of Midupi for two years. In my view, that's not an accident. That you'd have companies who normally are paid, they do this job all the time, to prepare sites for construction of whatever. And they messed this one up so badly that it, decided, it delays construction of Midupi by two years. I'm saying I don't think that was an accident. It's consistent with these people who intervened with regards to SARS. They were intervening with regard to the matter of electricity. Mitupi, Kusile, were supposed to have been completed by 2014. In which case there would never have been this electricity crisis. But Kusile is still not completed to this day. Why? Seven years after the uh, uh, construction of uh, Kusile started, seven years, it was not generating any, whatever you call that unit, of electricity after seven years. Obviously, this is very embarrassing to anybody. So what ESCOM did 
was to hire an Indian company, the Tata Brothers. Hired the Tata Brothers to come and build Unit 1 of Kusil. And the reason they did that is because that company had built another power station in India, which was more or less a replica of Kusil. So they came indeed and they, they built Unit 1 of Kusil. So at last Kusil was generating electricity. So this company was expecting that uh, their contract would then be extended to build Unit 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But ESCOM said to them, no, we can't extend your contract unless you have got a BEE partner. So the Indians wanted to know, we brought 50 engineers and technicians from India, and the rest of the staff is staff at ESCOM that we worked with. When you say we must have a BEE partner, how do you do that? Are there black engineers and technicians who can then come and become our partners? Maybe that's black empowerment. No, that wasn't working because already they had 120, 130 people under mentorship, engineers. Well, in the end, the matter couldn't be resolved of this BEE partner, so the Indians left. They finished their work in 2016. That unit one of uh, Kusile was integrated in the grid in 2017. I'm saying to, do, to, to this day, we have not finished completing, constructing Kusile. And yet it's quite clear, if this business had not popped up of a BEE partner, Kusile would have been completed a long time ago. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain that whoever said to these Indians, get a BEE partner, it was not of, out of interest in terms of BEE matters. It was to delay the construction of Kusil. So colleagues, I think you know, you can see where I'm going. Uh, in 1994, we, uh, in our assessment of the situation in the country, we said, uh, I'm talking now about the ANC, we said it's obvious that uh, not everybody in South Africa will be happy with the change that is taking place. Therefore, it's inevitable, it's inevitable that there will be an attempt at counter-revolution. It's inevitable. And we thought that attempt would come via violence, there would be bombings and be assassination of people and all that. And indeed, we were quite correct, that's what happened. I think you'd, call, you'd, you'd recall the people got arrested, then the Puremach and all that. Uh, I don't know if they're out of jail now which set off some bombs and so on. And in a sense, when the, the security forces succeeded to do that, yeah, our understanding was that, well, this counter-revolution that we had feared, in fact, has been dealt with. And we were quite wrong. You will see I'm sure, uh, all of you, again, educated people. There's quite a lot of discussion in the media about what is meant by the National Democratic Revolution. And a lot of opinion here that this is a program that was decided by Lenin in Russia many years ago. It's a communist program and it's stage one towards socialism. 
You find that a lot of that discussion. Yeah. And that's part of the thinking that informed the counter-revolution. But in this ANC, what is this ANC? This ANC is nothing but a proxy of Moscow. It's a communist front. What it wants to do with South Africa is to reproduce that socialism following the stage one of the National Democratic Revolution. So we must defeat it by all means. I'm talking about the thinking, the ideology between this country revolutionary intervention. So what I'm saying, colleagues, in the end, in order to understand this age number two, according to Dr. Andres, where you then have all of these negatives, none of them are accidental. You cannot have an ANC government performing as it did during age number one, and suddenly, in age two, it behaves in the opposite direction. There's been a change somewhere. And that change includes a change in the leadership of the ANC. So, when we're talking about, therefore, what is to be done? Tim Siller said, this ANC breakaways, uh, coalition politics, and all of, what do we do about all of that? I'm saying in that context of what's been happening in the country, how do we understand the breakaways? Or just take, take the MK party. You, you can't say you can't say, I, remember, I remain a member of the ANC, but I support a party which is going to campaign to defeat the ANC. That doesn't make sense. One of those two things is wrong. So in terms of this breakaways from the ANC, take, take that breakaway. Uh, you can understand that. Uh, it is led by the same people who tried to destroy SARS. It's the same, it's the same people. It is exactly the same people. So you can understand who they are. Uh, or even take the youth. Uh, Take the Youth League of the ANC. Got affected by all of this. At some point you have an ANC Youth League which has got its own political platform. Separate, different from the political platform of the ANC. It can't be ANC Youth League, it must be somebody else's Youth League. What happened? Suddenly you've got, uh, you know, the uh, very popular thing. I think even my com comrade president here referred to about land. Yeah. There's established ANC policy, which is in the Freedom Chart. If you come to me to say, now let's still do something about the land. I'd say, bear in mind what we've said in that Freedom Charter for many decades. The land shall be shared among those who work it. That is a very well thought out position, strategic position with regard to solving a number of issues here. The national question, the land question, how do we handle it? No, somebody pops up. No, 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 no. Let's take the land and give it to our people. So I say, me, I belong to the ANC. Who, according to the ANC in South Africa, is not our people? There's nobody who's not our people. 
That's ANC policy. Somebody else's policy might be very different. But that's why the ANC says this, land shall be shared among those who work it. Black and white and whoever they are. But I'm saying you have a, a youth league which is called an ANC youth league, which has got a very different policy from the ANC on this matter. Is it ANC? It's not. It's a youth league, sure, but a youth league of somewhere else. Uh, I'm trying to indicate, colleagues, what has happened, which has produced these two ages that Dr. Andres talks about, age number one, where everything is going this way, and age number two, when things are going the other direction. Under the same political party. So, I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of our response to all of these challenges about coalitions and so on, the uh, question that we must ask, where do we want South Africa to be? Not where do we want the political parties to be, where do we want South Africa to be? In terms of employment, in terms of everything that we talked about, industrialization and so on. And who will get us there? You'll read all of the election manifestos, all of them without exception. That's all of them say, we will get you there. Whom do you believe? I think there's a major political struggle that has to take place here, in part based on a proper understanding of the state of the nation. Not the state of the nation as we wish it to be, but that it actually is. You take these matters about industrialization, manufacturing, and so on. Leadership, comparison to China. Uh, the Johann Rupert, a uh, very senior business person in the country, uh, did an interview a few years back, I think with Power FM, And Juan Rupert says something which I, I was very, very glad he said it. Uh, he's generally a very honest person. Speaks his mind. And he said there was a certain period. There was a certain period in the country, as he describes it, it's during this age one. We should have taken advantage of that situation to invest in the South African economy. We didn't. And the reason we didn't is because we were uncertain about its future. Now that's a very senior business leader in the country who says that. At some point we, I can think I can tell the story now, we talked to the government of China because uh, clothing and textiles here were suffering greatly because of imports from China. As you know, I was saying that you look around, all sorts of items of clothing are made in China. So we talked to the government of China to say, look, this industry of ours is dying because of imports from China. Please do something to stop this flow. Uh, I hope the Chinese government won't be angry with me for telling this story. They agreed. They said, all right. Uh, so they would intervene to re reduce the flow of 
the Chinese exports to South Africa in order to help South African clothing and Eastern Italy to survive. And then said something which was very, very interesting to me. They said, part of what we will do, we will help your companies to catch up in terms of technology. Because they've fallen way behind in terms of te technology in this sector. So that by the time we normalize the situation, they would have caught up with the rest of the world in terms of technological development. What had happened now, because of the thing that Johan Rupert is talking about, of a great reluctance by a major part of the capitalist sector to invest in the South African economy, what had happened in the clothing and industry, in the clothing and and the textile and clothing sector was that level of investment that dropped that includes adoption of modern technologies. It was part of this general phenomenon of what Kossad used to call an investment strike. Because in truth, a great part of capital in this country was very uncertain about the future of the country. This miracle that people talked about was too good to be true. One day there will be a big explosion. Therefore, why invest? That's part of the reason for the drop even in manufacturing. Yeah. That was stage two, age two, when you have that phenomenon. During age one, you have a, a very different process of investments in this economy and so on, but suddenly it changes. So I'm saying to, un to answer those questions about industrialization, uh, technological development, manufacturing, even leadership, you've got to discuss it within that context. Yeah. Because these questions never arose during age one. There were no questions about leadership, about this and that and the other, because things were working. These matters arise, but questions arise now because things are going the other way. And that's a challenge we face as South Africans to grapple with this reality, <coughs> which has impacted in all elements of national life. You go, can go through each one of the state corporations, ESCOM, Danel, Transnet, what has happened to all of them? And what has happened to all of them is not accidental. It's particular interventions to make sure that this democracy doesn't work. One of the interesting phenomena in West Africa, let me not necessarily, let me stay West Africa, but say something else. You know, there will be a, a I think somebody mentioned this earlier, there will be elections in Senegal later this month, the presidential elections. Now, what had happened in Senegal was that over the last two years or so, uh, the most popular person in terms of the opposition he had got into trouble, got arrested and charged and so on. In the, in the end, I think he got charged for something, found guilty on the charge of corrupting the youth, uh, something like that. Sentenced. Uh, by far the most popular politician, I'm talking about a gentleman called Usman Sonko. Yeah. So that is in jail. And people were killed in Senegal demonstrating against his arrest and imprisonment. Genuinely popular figure. So uh, 
because of this concern about democracy on the continent. And Senegal stands out on the continent as one of the few countries on the continent which has never had a military coup. Since independence in 1960, there's never been a coup there. You'd have elections and then the come parties lose elections and new ones take over. But there was a crisis now because here is the most popular leader who's opposite side of the president in another party but is in jail. So, uh, so we engaged, we engaged with President, President Makisal to say, but President, uh, Senegal is very, very important on the continent as this great exemplar, exemplar of democracy. It illustrates very, very firmly, very conclusively that we as Africans know how to manage democratic systems. And we can't afford to have Senegal fall back on that. And therefore, let the matter of Usman Songo, who wants to run for president, let that matter be decided by the voters, not by prison orders. Yeah. And just before I came here, I saw a lovely report that President Makisal has intervened, uh, declared an amnesty all the prisoners out of jail, including Usman Songo. Uh, <clears throat> and pardoned various charges, as a result of which Usman Songo is running for president. That was... Uh, <clears throat> An excellent intervention made by the President of Senegal. Precisely to say it's, it's a responsibility of the Senegalese or the rest of us to defend this democracy, particularly, you raised quite correctly, in the context of the military takeovers that have been taking place, particularly in West Africa. But I think we've got to understand this about the West Africa situation. You know, uh, a few years back, you remember we had to work with, the, uh, with Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire to help them to get sorted out. And one of the things that we found was that there was an agreement with France signed at the point of the independence of Cote d'Ivoire, that France would maintain a military barracks in Abidjan, the capital. And the commander of the French troops, in any situation where he felt the security of Cote d'Ivoire or the security of France was threatened, he had the power, sovereign power, a French general to take over the public station broadcasting and announce whatever he liked. It's one of the agreements, one of the 12 or so agreements that not only Cote d'Ivoire, but many countries of the Francophone, the Francophone countries that signed with France at independence. Mali, Mali just now has just repudiated all of those agreements. I think there were 11 or 12 of them. Which include prescriptions about when you've generated a foreign currency, bank it in Paris. Yeah. And Paris, the French franc then, would guarantee your currency, CFA. Part of what is happening yeah, in, uh, in West Africa, Palisa, as you can see, is a rebellion by young officers against French neocolonialism. It's not only military coups to remove uh, some elected president, but these young soldiers are saying, our politics since independence 
has respected this junior relationship with France. That must end. So you see the big confrontation between these countries and France. It has to do with ending the, like the agreements I've talked about. That you'd have a French general based in Cote d'Ivoire who has actually the power to intervene in Cote d'Ivoire as he liked. So it's, it's an anti-neocolonial rebellion. It has got this element, you are quite correct, of uh, removing elected presidents. How does the continent deal with that? Well, you know the OAU has a standard policy, as you, as you mentioned, uh, against illegal changes of government. So the military governments don't get recognized. But we have a particular consequence now where Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso decide that they are walking out of ECOWAS. Now that can be a positive development. What is to be done? It's not a question that we can answer here. But I think, again, I'm trying to say, it's necessary for us to understand the objective reality. What actually is happening? It's not just young soldiers who are hungry for power and therefore remove this elected president. No. That's why they talk about Thomas Sankara. Sankara took power by coup d'etat. He was a soldier. But Sankara understood this particular issue, the need to destroy, destroy and defeat neocolonialism. And that's what these young soldiers are saying. What do we do with them? What does Africa do with them? I think Africa is an, an, a challenge, a problem, answering that issue, answering that question. Uh, Again, you see, with regard to these issues of uh, our need properly to understand what are we dealing with, it relates, for instance, to the matter you mentioned, Palisa, of uh, the situation in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That conflict. I'm, I'm, I'll repeat myself what I've said publicly. That the Congo, like all of us, we inherited colonial boundaries. And when the colonialists drew up the boundaries of the Democratic Republic of Congo, they included in the eastern parts of the Congo populations that were in Rwanda speaking. These are Congolese in terms of those colonial borders. But the problem for us and problem for the Congolese is that certainly even during the days of Mobutu, they did not, did not want to recognize the Rwandese who were Congolese as Congolese. You even had a formation there in the Eastern Congo of a military group, a militia, which was called the Mai Mai. The Mai Mai, was, was, whose purpose was to drive away these Rwandans back to Rwanda. And Mobutu was encouraging that. That problem persists to this day. As you know, the Congo, the DRC is a very big country. And one of the challenges since the return of democracy, which was there before, it persists, is the footprint of the government from Kinshasa is not necessarily strong everywhere in the country. 
So in the Kivus, this is part of the con problem, in the Kivus in the Far East, That's why you have the M23. It's because the Rwandan people, the Banyamulenge in Eastern Congo, have for many decades felt this, that they don't have the protection of the government in Kinshasa. So they need to protect themselves. In addition, you've had this challenge uh, of the people who committed the genocide in Rwanda, then they ran away into the Eastern Congo. So they are also there. Some of them involved in all sorts of schemes and naturally to try and overthrow the government in Rwanda. I'm saying that the first, my view, is the first part in terms of dealing with the crisis in the Eastern Congo is recognizes that the Banyamulenge are Congolese. The Rwandan-speaking section of the population of the Congo is Congolese. And therefore must be protected by the government of the Congo like all the population of the Congo is entitled to protection by the government. That's a starting point. And then this issue has to be dealt with. Then what about the interests of Rwanda in the Eastern Congo, about the Rwandans, this group that con con committed the suicide, genocide, as well as these Rwandan-speaking people. How do you regulate that relationship? But I'm saying the principal responsibility falls on the government of, of the Congo to protect the Rwandan-speaking population of the Eastern Congo, of the Kivus. I think an understanding of those issues, why the coups d'etat in West Africa, why this commotion in the Congo, we must, fortunately we are, as members of this particular school, as it was explained, we must be the first ones to understand the objective reality. What is the reality we are dealing with? Not necessarily to be, by, to be bought by slogans, as popular sayings, because they are popular, therefore they must be true. That's not necessarily correct. The illicit financial flows that Jonathan raised uh, in our study of the issue, we were saying that we found that the principal culprits with regard to the international uh, financial flows, act, uh, outflows from Africa, for instance, were the corporations. It's the major companies that are responsible. And when those uh, monies get out of the continent, they end up somewhere in the developed world including in these areas called tax havens. And therefore we said, even in our report, therefore the struggle against international financial flows, you can't localize it. Yes, as Africans we suffer from this problem, but you can't resolve it entirely just by interventions in Africa. You got to also intervene in those countries which receive those outflows. I'm very, very happy that uh, in the end, what has happened now is that at last, finally, the rest of the world responded to that. As a consequence of which there is now a process at the United Nations, there's a process at the United, approved by the General Assembly, to, to prepare a draft international convention tax convention to deal with this matter of illicit financial flows so that you can deal with it comprehensively, not, not regionally, but comprehensively globally. And the United Nations is now in the process of drawing that international tax convention which will deal with this matter. 
what is required in the, in the continent is to build the necessary, first of all, the understanding of the issue and the necessary capacity. The necessary capacities, even in our tax authorities, to understand, to understand this. Uh, when we're preparing the report, for instance, we went to Nigeria, we went to the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, we went to Mozambique, we came here, number of countries. And so we get to Nigeria, and one of the things we find, we're told by the Nigerians, it's not the customs service in Nigeria which measures how much oil is produced and exported from Nigeria. That's a matter that is decided in the office of the president. And because the office of the president does not have the capacities that customs have, they are dependent on what the oil companies report. And they were saying to us that uh, their own view, customs, was that uh, it's likely that the country was operating on the basis of an underestimate of a third, an underestimate of a third of the oil that was being exported. We go to the Congo, uh, and the Congolese say, we don't, actually don't know how much copper we're exporting. We're dependent on the copper com on the mining companies to tell us. Mozambique same. Uh, got these fishing trawlers who fish for prawns and all this. What is the catch of the prawns? How much of it is exported? Entirely dependent on the report of the fishing companies. I think that's what's an indication I'm saying of the capital. We need to build up the capacity within our countries to be able to do that in order to, to get a handle on this matter of illicit financial flows. Or take a last example I will give here. South African company gets, gets itself registered in Switzerland. And in the books, it is owned by, it's owned in Switzerland. So it exports money from here because they are paying the owner who is in Switzerland. And the owner is not at all a Swiss. It's two young officials from their company here. They post them in, in, in Zurich. You put a label in a room, this is company so-and-so. And they exported something like $2 billion, like that. These illicit financial flows out of here. And fortunately, the, our tax authorities here managed to get a handle of that. And working with the Swiss and the British, they managed to recover that money. But it was entirely because of the capacity that there was in SARS, to track down a, a, a crooked exchange of that kind. But I'm saying, it, Jonathan, that uh, the matter of illicit financial flows remains with us. It's a very serious issue. But fortunately, at last, the whole world is saying, OK, let's get together and deal with this matter, even via a tax law, which will be binding on all countries in the world. A very, very important state forward, step forward. Now, uh, I think I've answered all the questions. Uh, so, <laughs> but in the end, to come back here at home, it matter was very important. Question was raised about leadership. Leadership. I am saying that in, in our case, the first, first thing we've got to do about our leadership here is to get people to understand South Africa. 
I'm sure if you lined up uh, the leaders of these political parties who are contesting elections, and you said to them, how many of you have read the Nugent Report? I doubt if there's any one of them. <laughs> it's a very complex question, and uh, when you raise this, that there was some intervention that was made which results in this change. People take time to absorb that. Because it's too dramatic, I suppose. It's too... The last thing I will say is that uh, Dr. Endres says stage three which is the end of this transformation process. It says you can see the signs of stage three already in stage two. So in the end, what you are going to get is a South Africa that is governed by the private sector and the NGOs, with the states playing some minimal part. That's stage number three. Age number three. And this, as you can see, it happening already. Municipal councils can't fill potholes. The citizens collect themselves and they collect money and fill the potholes. Government can't give us electricity. The mining companies produce their own electricity. Policing is not effective, so I hire private security services. So he says, gradually, you can see this happening. In the end, what we're going to have is a South Africa governed by the private sector and the NGOs. And the democratic state will be a tiny little role. What that means is the condition of the majority of the poor in this country won't change. Because the private sector is not about to care about that majority. You need a strong democratic state to take care of this matter of inequality. But they say, he says, you can see it's disappearing. The democratic state. And that's where we're going. What do we do about all of those challenges? Those questions will not be answered by the elections. They must be answered by something else. What that something else is, I don't know. But thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Wow. I guess we, we have engaged. Our thoughts are still reeling and working hard to think about all this information that we, we just uh, received at this point in time. And this is information that you may not get in the books. And that's why these conversations are so important, are so important. You may not be able to get them. And I think one of the things that really uh, touched me is when the president was talking about 1994 uh, as a, a defeat, and now, uh, and then those that we defeated are looking at us to say, we're going to get them somewhere there. And age one, which was much more about fortifying our democracy. And when we see uh, age two, the government as well being a player in the destruction of our democracy. And I think these are very, very uh, touching points when we think about our, our country and where we are uh, uh, today. And uh, at this point, I'm going to give our panelists one parting shot and open for the floor. Uh, I think we will be done in at half past, as, 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 as suggested. 
So, Tembisile, do you have something uh, that you would like to say uh, f- uh, before you, you leave? Um, definitely, definitely. I think uh, before just a short comment, uh, Program Director, I think what, um, l- listening to all the questions from the panelists, uh, it took me back to what Mr. Lezualo was saying when um, he overheard the discussion from the two professors. Um, <laughs> I guess we know the answer is everything. Prison make is everything. <laughs> he encompasses all of that. Uh, my parting shot, President, I took a lot from um, this, this, this session, and thank you very much. I believe that um, the takeaway mostly was your question of who will take us there. I think that is one very prominent question that we as South Africa need to ask ourselves especially because we've got um, elections coming up on the 29th of April, so and of May, my apologies. And um, this is a question that everyone here in this room, um, everyone here watching online and everyone um, in South Africa that's going to vote president need to ask themselves in order to ascertain who to vote for and where they see our country moving forward. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Danielle? Thank you so much. I appreciate how you have broken down the last 30 years into three different dispensations and just to get an overall understanding of how we got to where we are at this moment. And I think my parting short speaks to, to, for me, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I hope as Africans and as South Africans, we can really make a conscious decision about who we elect into power and not just politicians, but thought leaders. Thank you. Alisa? Thank you very much, Program Director, um, His Excellency. Thanks for the response. I, I, I quite appreciate the fact that uh, when we are looking at the developments in the continent and juxtaposing them to what is happening here at home, it very much brings us closer to that age three. That might look something like uh, institutions when they begin to erode what is the position of a citizen in that process. And hence, I I, I would like going forward for us to think about means of involving or driving a citizen-centric democracy. So citizens that are conscious and being able to uh, participate actively in the democracy without only seeing elections as part of the democracy. Thanks. Thank you, Palisa. And I think... The president also underscored a very important point around the fight in the West, uh, the military coup being an anti neocolonialism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I think, yes, definitely the coup and the bad coup. All right. Okay. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm sure you can all agree it's been an, uh, an intellectually stimulating event. And there's just one thing I want to say before everyone goes. Um, When you're at the voting stations and you're staring at that sheet of voting paper, uh, please just remember one thing. Remember the party that bought you your freedom. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I'm going to ask our panelists, can we give them the last round as they go to their seats? As you go to their seats. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, now is your turn. And... I don't know if uh, there's people with mics to assist me. Anyway, now it's your turn and we have very limited time, as you can see. Yes, five minutes. No, let's, let's wait for the program. Oh, yes, I'm taking five questions, yes. All right, I thought you say five minutes and I'm like, hey, how am I going to do five minutes? Uh, hey, there's, there's so many hands. I'm going to make sure that this side is represented, this side and this side, and that side, all the five. Okay? Yes. A gentleman there? Oh, I don't see you, Mama. I was seeing her. 
Sorry. Let's try to get into the question. Gonna go here. Thank you, Chairperson and the President, for an informative session. Um, looking back to history, of uh, the first year of democracy, uh, South Africa managed to come out of economic meltdown because of the good economic policies that we had. I just want to find out where did we uh, drop the ball. And then going to the upcoming election, do you think that the current ANC can assist us to revive what we had? Thank you. There's a hand here. Good, good afternoon, Mr. President. I don't know if you remember me from a long time ago. It's Tim Duplessis. I'm a journalist. Tim. But my question is, Mr. President, it was wonderful to listen to you this afternoon, reflecting backwards and a little bit forward as well. About yourself and your remarkable political career, you've been president of the ANC for two terms, president of the country for two terms. What do you think you would have done differently, looking back now? If, if, is, is there something where you can say today, I should have done this, that or the other? Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, thank you for a, a very interesting talk. Um, my question is, do you still dream of the African Renaissance? I see you here talking and there are a lot of problems, and especially in terms of problems of during your time as president. But what I'm not hearing from you, and current time as well, but what I'm not hearing for you, from you is your ideas on the future, on where you think we should be going, where would you like us to go? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ambassador, the Ambassador of Senegal is here. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Becky. And thank you, South African people. I just would like to attest that you played a key role in helping Senegal got out of this severe crisis. Among other leaders of the continent, you helped us. And that is something very, very important that we will never forget. I just wanted to make that statement to attest and to say that today, Senegal is showing again that we are a strong democracy. We have strong institution. We face this crisis, but we are getting out of it with the support of the continent, with the support of South Africa, and with your support, President Becky. Thanks again. Last question, this side. Yeah, the lady with the black, uh, black jersey. Yeah. Good 
day to you all. My name is Liza Maziba and I'm a first year student learning international relations here in this institution. Now you asked, of, you asked us to ask ourselves, where do we want to see South Africa? And as the youth of South Africa, I'm a very op optimistic person. And I see a South Africa where there's no tribalism, where there's no GBV, where where a student just, who just recently finished their matric does not, is not forced to take a gap year because universities are full. And where a woman over, or a man over 35 is unable to, to continue learning because NSFAS no longer funds them. But I have one question for you, sir which is, what would you tell a person who's not as optimistic as I am about looking forward to in this country? Because it is not that easy for South Africans to be optimistic at this point. But what would you advise that person? What would you say to that person in order for them to see Africa or South Africa in your light? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. The president has missed your key question. Uh, that's why I was saying, let's get to the question. What is the question? You, you, my brother. The question, Your Excellency, is why is the African Union or SADC does not use your expertise as a peacekeeping person, especially that you've got cordial and brother relationships with President Kagame. We can capitalize on those relationships with President Kagame that I personally know that you have to try and help the situation Kigali than being and, and DRC than being hostile. That's the question. <laughs> yes, the time. <laughs> You see, you see, look at the hands, look at the hands, look at the hands, and I'm being unfair to everyone. So let's allow the president to, if he allows us to take a second chance, I will do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll have to be very brief, no, like the, not like the last time. I want to say, first of all, thanks a lot to the Ambassador of Senegal. Because indeed, as she says, uh, I contacted her and said, Ambassador, please, here is a task. We need to speak to President Makisal because here is a challenge. And indeed, she actually responded, which is not normal, Ambassador, to actually said, I have delivered your message. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. <clears throat> but really, I'm, I'm very, very proud of what President Makisal has done. I've worked with the President Makisal for quite a, long, quite a long time. So I was fairly confident when I spoke to him, I raised the matter with him to say, but here is a challenge, a common challenge we both of us understand. And this is how I think Senegal should behave. Uh, I'm really very, very proud of the manner in which you responded to that. The, the, uh, nobody has spoken to me about what to do about the DRC here at home. They haven't. I don't know why, but they haven't. Uh, next month, uh, Rwanda will be marking the 30th anniversary of the genocide. Uh, I, I, President Kagame has sent an invitation, I'll be going there. Because I think for us, all of us as Africans, that that's an important anniversary to mark in order to address these issues about peace and stability on our continent. Um, 
in a sense, the, the issue about peace, uh, well, let me come at it differently. You'd recall that uh, our colleagues in East Africa, this African community, decided to send a group into the Congo to help resolve the challenges in the Eastern Congo. It was led by President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now, he contacted me to say, I've been appointed in this thing. What do you think? So we discussed the matter. And indeed, I told him what I thought, that uh, the first challenge to really to overcome is to get the Congolese to understand that is a Congolese problem. It doesn't originate from outside of the Congo. You remember even when we had the negotiations with the Congolese, when they met here in Sun City to negotiate the transition to democracy and so on, one of the negotiating groups there was the RCD. And the RCD was an armed group. There were three armed groups. The RCD was one of them, which came out of the Kivus. Because of the population in the Kivus felt the need to defend itself. So it actually had an armed representative in the negotiations to negotiate the future of the Congo. As a reality that was understood by the Congolese themselves, they didn't say, RCD, you are not wanted here. So they were part of the solution. But I'm saying that I think the matter about this peace in the, uh, in the, Eastern, Congo, in the Eastern DRC has become too factionalized. Because I saw somewhere on the television that uh, somebody asked one of the Congolese, but to the East Africans came here and so on. Now we are getting the Southern Africans. What happened? And the response was, no, no, we don't want those. We didn't want those East Africans because they, they were very deceitful. They didn't tell us that, in fact, they supported Rwanda. Therefore, we chased them away. I, I immediately understood what he meant. Because indeed, uh, uh, President Kenyatta, leading that East African group, engaging the Congolese government, raised this thing to say, but the Rwandans in the Eastern Congo are Congolese. You've got to treat them as, as, as Congolese. That was interpreted as, therefore, you are in support of Rwanda, go away. In a sense, you've got to find a way of depoliticizing the matter so that it can be dealt with objectively. Yeah. In the first instance by the African Union, which is facing its own challenges. What I was trying to say with regard to our economy here yeah, and why it's performed differently is not that one of colleague was saying, why at what point did we drop the ball? We didn't drop any ball. As I say, you can, you can just look at the statistics yourself, do the research yourself, you're a university. Just look at what happened during this age one that Andres is talking about. The economy was performing very well. It was growing, levels of investment in the, going, in the economy were growing, levels of numbers of people employed were growing. We, we even had uh, something we're looking at with my colleague as we're coming here. There's a few years uh, where we actually had budget surpluses. And you have a budget surplus in order to generate resources, not to pay the money lenders, but to build schools and clinics and roads and so on. And the report says this was the first time since, 20, since 1913 that this country had budget surpluses for the very first time in an entire century. To generate the resources to be able to attend to the matter of the upliftment of our people. Instead of paying the bankers because you owe them too much money. 
We didn't drop the ball. But somebody else intervened to produce a negative result. Assisted by people within our ranks who in fact were not part of us. They wore the same t-shirts and I think that uh, the, uh, this thing about optimism, starting here at home, you know, the ANC has said in a number of conferences, uh, the ANC must renew itself. And it says for its own survival. It's a very, very important statement made by National Conference of the ANC. It's because those delegates understood what was going wrong. That something had happened to the quality of the membership of the ANC. Such that even the character of the ANC was changing. Because of what is happening to that membership. And they said, renew. In, for your own survival. That is an ANC decision. That challenge remains. But the point I'm raising it is because I think that's part of what drives my sense of confidence. That there are still many people in the ANC who know very well that something is wrong. And therefore something needs to be done. And identify the thing that is wrong correctly. And it's not difficult. It's been identified in successive conferences. I've seen documents prepared by our veterans, which look at our ANC conferences since 1997. National conferences, NGCs, policy conferences, <coughs> and all of them up to date say one thing <clears throat> and they say the quality of the membership of the ANC is declined that since ANC became government you had too many staff riders people who came in because this was an opportunity to get a job in government and to steal and put something in your pocket and they are there members of the ANC wearing t ANC t-shirts So when, when, when the membership itself says we need to renew ourselves, it communicates a message that there is hope. That there are people there, ordinary members of the ANC who are saying there's something wrong here. And I think that is a sentiment that would be shared by the generality of our population. If you went to the population and said, dear population, look what we've done. We've removed all of the thieves who've been leading the branches of the ANC. They're all gone. The population would give you a standing ovation. I think that's what gives hope. If you look at, I talked earlier about what Kosatu had described as a, an investment strike. But a very, very interesting phenomenon is that during 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic starts, the government puts out an economic reconstruction and renewal, whatever, economic plan 2010 business did the same thing its own plan for economic uh, renewal both of which were supposed to serve within the NEDLEC process 
So the business people surrendered their, they submitted their plan to government, which would bring it into the NEDLAC process. And what I, I found really, truly remarkable in that business proposal was that business, well, let me say, start somewhere else. It was a meeting of the ANC where I say, I have read the, uh, the government reform, economic report. It is 32 pages. I've read the business report. It's 132 pages. So I say it's clear to me that more work has been done by business in terms of what are the steps to be taken to really revive this economy. The president, President Ramaphosa, at the end of that discussion said, well, Komitabo is correct. The business did they do their plan, but what he is wrong about is the length. He says 132 pages. In fact, it's 1,000 pages. It illustrated exactly the point that business had done a lot of detailed work and said this plan we are proposing would cost three trillion rand over three years. We as a, as, a, as a private sector commit ourselves to spend a trillion rand. This was the very, very first time since 1994 that the private sector made a commitment of that kind. And a trillion rand over three years, they said a trillion rand over three years, and the end of the three years, of course, we'll do more planning. But that was a very, very serious commitment to help to create these factories and mines and this that we need. That's part of what gives me optimism. That clearly there's a change in the thinking of some of the business leaders so that they could make a commitment of that kind in writing. And that is similar to the, we went to, a, we have my sister here who's sitting in the front row. She comes from the embassy of Guinea, Guinea Conakry. Uh, our last Africa Day lecture, that was Africa Day last year, was in Guinea Conakry. So she was our host uh, in Conakry. Uh, at the end of that lecture, part of what we did uh, was to address some of the universities around Conakry. And our lecturer, uh, himself a Guinean, said, uh, arising out of these discussions with these African students, the Guinean students, that it's, it's therefore absolutely imperative that we must work to, re to revive the African Renaissance movement. Because these young Guineans were saying, here are the ch changes that are facing us on the continent. And for that, in order to respond to these challenges, we need this Renaissance movement. And he promised that he was going to start immediately, to starting with those students in Conakry, to build that. That's why I'm saying, even about the Ren African Renaissance on the continent, I'm hopeful because the, the people, the masses of the people of our continent, still have that vision. I think part of what's happened at the point of the leadership, uh, there's been obviously a decline in the commitment to, to Pan-Africanism among our leadership across the board, that includes South Africa. There's been a reduction in that commitment that pan Africanist commitment. <clears throat> and therefore, a reduction in the focus on these issues about the African Renaissance, for instance. Yeah. Even now, there is a discussion. The, the new commission, the Commission of the African Union, will be re elected in January 
next year. So there's a hot discussion going on now about the processes for the election of that uh, AU commission. And I think if you stay close enough to the AU, you would understand why that's a hot issue. Because you have these conflicts taking place on the continent, the conflicts in the Sahel, the, conflicts in, the conflict in Sudan. Sudan is tearing itself apart. Uh, quarrel between now and today between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, the conflict in northern Mozambique uh, or the eastern Congo or Libya. And you look at those and you say, where is the AU? And ask anybody here to challenge you to say, this is what the AU is doing about this, that, and that. Nowhere to be seen. Something wrong there. But I'm saying that the sentiment among the young people, like the sentiment we picked up in Guinea Conakry uh, from the young people, was the importance of this renaissance and the need for them to reconstruct that movement so that this becomes an agent of change. I think that's what gives uh, hope. Uh, to produce something different, uh, here I think must start, as I was saying, with the understanding of our reality. Yeah. And my challenge to members of the ANC would be to say, very, very critical in terms of producing something different, is to do what the conference has said, a genuine process of the renewal of the ANC. Part of what is problematic about it, that renewal, is I sitting in some senior position in the ANC. I'm not sure that I can survive the renewal process. Uh, it might identify me and say, this is one of the ones we don't want. <laughs> so I will therefore block, I will block the process of renewal because it affects me personally. But I'm saying the challenge I would make to the ANC is that let's implement what conference has said. This renewal. And you can't say it's now been possible to convene a branch of the ANC which has not held, we had not met for two, for two years. It's now meeting. Therefore, that's a renewal. It's not. Who are these people who are meeting? They may correct a million times, but who are they? Are they the same people who are busy destroying SARS and are busy correcting an ANC branch? I think something different will come from that process. And that would include to produce something different, really to implement what was commonly agreed in 2020. That the problems facing the country require all of us to join hands. That business, government, labor, civil society, let's work together. This social compact. With all of the work that was done, it was never achieved. And yet that is the only way to pull the country out of what it is. 70% of new investment in the South African economy, historically, has come from the private sector. You can't rely only on the public sector to regenerate this economy. Where the private sector produces 70% of new investment, 
You can't do without it. And where the private sector agreed, as it agreed in terms of the social compact, let's work together to define what is to be done. I think we didn't quite take advantage of that opportunity. That's one of the things that is outstanding, to do something different about this country, to produce that social compact. Indeed, uh, what our colleagues were saying, uh, we want a society where there's no tribalism, no gender-based violence, and, and, and all of these things gone. Even in terms of education, uh, and part of the tragedy, part of the, our tragedy, in my view, is that in, in reality, as a country, we've got policies on all of these issues. I don't know of any issue where we don't have a good policy. Um, But something goes wrong somewhere. The policy remains policy, the practice is very different. Um, how do we cure that? Yeah. Issue of crime, for instance, is raised quite correctly. And the positions of the, the country The positions are correct. But something went wrong. For instance, the, you remember the, the ministry responsible for this was uh, the Minister of Safety and Security. And then at some point they changed it. It was the Minister of Police. Uh, so we got a Minister of Police instead of Minister of Safety and Security. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, you had National Commissioner of Police, uh, Provincial Commissioners, Inspectors, and this, that changed. They became generals and colonels and military ranks. I'm saying the policy to make sure that the citizens enjoy safety and security. The policies are there. But when you take this instrument and militarize it, and you begin to produce slogans like shoot to kill, that's what soldiers do, that's not what police do. Yeah. I'm saying the policies, I mean, many of these issues are there. We've got to attend to this matter. Where are the institutions? And therefore the people, the warm bodies, practically to make sure that these correct policies are implemented. That's a challenge. But thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you.